So we begin the second canto of the Book of Yoga, the parable of the search for the soul. That is the title of the canto. And in the series of sections in Savitri, we are now on section 115. 115th section of Savitri. We have already seen earlier Savitri's condition in a certain way you are speaking helplessness at the same time well poised, composed she gathering herself, everything into the inner being of hers. She has become quiet, mute. In fact, her grief had become so intense, so powerful that in itself turn into a person and that grief's self became calm, mute, immutable, dumb-eyed, resolved. Now, it is in this state that Savitri's Yuga is about to begin. There is nothing now of this world, passion, vital impulses, relationships, thoughts, nothing is going to disturb her at the moment. Her state is such that she has become a perfect support, a perfect adar for the occult and spiritual things to happen in her. She is now a well prepared adar. It is not get shaken by anything. It is only when the personality is stabilized, when there is no disturbance at all that the higher powers, when they enter in, can easily work in a person. Savitri has now opened herself to that working, that the higher power can come and work into her. She is not going to disturb the working of that power. So that is already a great city, a yogic preparation she has accomplished. While she was enjoying the happiness of a married life, yet the yogic state of Imrishamitri is something very remarkable. How does that happen? Normally, in the case of a common man who is turning towards spirituality, it takes long periods of time for any spiritual experience to happen in him. It doesn't happen today, tomorrow. It takes a long time before anything spiritual or occult can start working in the case of an ordinary aspirant soul. But here is Savitri who is now ready to receive the spiritual guidance and go entirely, totally, unreservedly on the path which will be shown to her. 
she has already accomplished that city. How did she do that? Well, actually, this is not the city we she required recently in the past few days, past few weeks, past few months. It has been there with her, deep in the secret nature of hers, always there. She was born with that. And the moment the occasion comes, it expresses itself. Savitri has done the yoga through the ages, through lives, and it is that accumulated perfection, realization, which is now coming forward in the present birth of hers. Because it is from this point onward now that the new features of the yoga had to enter into her life. She has not to redo all that was already done by her in her past lives. With the present life, something new has to happen. She has become ready. It was during the entire period of one year in the company of Satyavan, in the company of the forest sages, in the spiritual atmosphere which is there all around, that the past got awakened in her and it is that now which is launching her into the future. Her future has to begin with that. Let us read the opening passages of the canto. As in the vigilance of the sleepless night, to the slow, heavy footed, silent hours, representing in her bosom his load of grief, she sat, staring in the dumb trade of time and the approach of ever nearing fate. A summons from her being summit came, a sound, a call that broke the seals of night. Above her brows, where will the knowledge meet, a mighty voice invaded mortal space. It seemed to come from inaccessible heights and yet was intimate with all the world and knew the meaning, the steps of time and saw eternal destinies chainless seeing, filling the far prospect of the cosmic gaze. Already the sweep of her realization, of her experience, of her beginning is as vast as the cosmic gaze. Already it is deep, profound, dense, powerful, as the power of herself, of her soul itself, a mighty voice. She would hold that mighty voice. She is not one who is shattered by the impact of the voice. And that voice is a mighty voice also. She would not be. So, the alhara, the support, is ready. The vessel to receive spiritual initiation 
is well baked. Tapta. She has already done silent tapasya in her inner being and made the vessel ready to receive divine command. That is the state in which Savitri is there. This is what we are describing, what, what we see here in his brief introduction with which Devga of Savitri is being narrated to us. Already there are very significant hints given to us. One of the things which strikes us most here is the supernatural state in which all these things are happening. The character of Savitri Yoga is all the luminous occult kind. It is more tantric in nature than Vedantic. Hers is going to be the yoga of the Tantra, not the yoga of the Adhyatma kind. She is going to launch on a very special yoga of the Tantra, not also so much the traditional Tantra, but the Tantra very specific to Savitri. She is there and already a high power comes and makes an entry into her forehead. That is an absolutely remarkable kind of beginning of the yoga. It doesn't happen in the case of an ordinary yogi. The Kundalini starts rising from below above, but here the impact is straight on the forehead. And it is on the forehead, Adnya Chakra, that she is receiving the command. Samans came to her from her being summit. From her being summit, the Samans are coming to her. Adnya, command is coming to her chakra, the way from which things will start moving now in that. The command is for Savitri to get ready to receive the full force in her soul and in her spirit so that she would meet death and conquer death and change fate. It is fated that Satyavan must die, but that has to be halted. It cannot be her fate really. And for that, the command has come. Savitri, rise, get up, do the yoga. How is the divine power, divine Shakti in your soul? That is what it is saying. Now, the entry of this command is on the forehead center, chakra, or lotus, whatever you want to call it. This Adnya chakra, or this lotus here, is of white color. It's a white lotus with just two petals. Now that itself is something significant, important also of course. The two petals would mean will and knowledge, the divine will and the divine sight, they have opened out here. The will, the force with which things will be done here, sankalpa, will, jnana, knowledge, 
it is at that center Savitri is receiving the command. Her will and her knowledge are getting awakened. These two petals would mean will and knowledge. It is by will that the divine fire is ignited in his soul and it is that burns and receives the spiritual bounties, spiritual power, knowledge, whatever is required. It is by knowledge that she will know what to do and how to proceed. So the center is already awakened. The lotus petals have opened out with will and knowledge. Above her brows where will and knowledge meet, a mighty voice invaded mortal space. Savitri has taken the mortal birth. And it is in that mortal space that this lotus has now bloomed with the impact of the mighty voice. Knowledge and will has set themselves into operation. So this is the command Adnya which Savitri is going to receive at his place here. A summon from a being summit came and the will and knowledge have awakened here. Now that command seems to be coming from inaccessible heights. Savitri's origin is in the transcendent. And to the mortal creature, Savitri has taken a mortal birth. She is human. And therefore, that origin of hers, the source of hers, is inaccessible. But the voice, the commanding spirit from there is guarding Savitri all the while. And it is that which is rushing into human Savitri. It seemed to come from inaccessible heights and yet was intimate with all the world. That Shakti, that power has concern with this world. It is intimate, it is close to the blight of this world, to the possibilities which can happen and grow and flourish in this world. It is in direct contact with this world. At the same time, in, it is inaccessible. And yet was intimate with all the world and knew the meaning, the steps of time, the moments of time, the course of events, the sequence of happenings. It has full knowledge of it. It has the knowledge of all the moments of time. It has what we would call Trikala Drishti. It knows the past, it knows the present, it knows the future and knew the meaning of the steps of time. It has Trikala Drishti when we see from our point of view. The eye has opened the Divya Chakshu has opened, the Divine Eye has opened, it sees things, it sees all the moments of time, the past, the present, the future. The Kala Drishti has opened the moment that voice makes his entry on Savitri's forehead and knew the meaning of the steps of time and saw eternal destinies change the scene filling the far prospect of the cosmic beings. It has the sweep of the entire creation of the cosmos, of the universe. And it has pervaded every nook and corner of this creation. It knows what is happening, what is going to happen, what must happen. It has the full knowledge of all those things. Above her brows where will and knowledge meet, 
A mighty voice invaded mortal space. It seemed to come from inaccessible heights, and yet was intimate with all the world, and knew the meaning with the steps of time, and saw eternal destinies, changes the seen, filling the far prospect of the cosmic gaze. That is how the yogic life of Savitri begins. It is the transcendental tantra which is getting into operation in Savitri. As I said, Savitri's forest center has opened. The two petals have opened out fully. The two petals also would indicate the manifest and the unmanifest, Shiva and Shakti. In the Tantric language, it would mean Shiva and Shakti. It is these which have now come into operation, will and knowledge, these have already opened, will, Shakti, knowledge, Shiva, he has a knowledge of everything. And these two centers now have come into operation. This center has come now into operation. The manifest and the unmanifest. What is manifest? What is going to manifest? It is that which Savitri has to attend. And she has launched us straight away on the occult yogic path, on the path of the occult, luminous occult the luminous Tantra Yoga. In contrast to the beginning of Savitri's Yoga, we had Ashwapati's Yoga, which is of the Vedantic kind, belonging to the Adhyatma, the spiritual. He is climbing the ascending slopes of heaven. Ashwapati is climbing, his yoga begins with the climbing of the ascending slopes of heaven, Arohana. Savitri's yoga is beginning with straightway the descent of the Supreme Voice into her being. That is the difference between the yoga of Ashwapati and Savitri. He is climbing up ascending slopes of heaven. Savitri's yoga is beginning with the coming down of the Mahavakya, the voice, the command, the summons, it is that which makes the beginning of Savitri's Yuga. Now, functionally, these two are different and therefore also in terms of realizations, the two Yugas and different possibilities. Ashwapati's Yoga is for a certain purpose. Savitri's Yoga is for a certain purpose. And it is in relationship with these two that the Yogas are being described here also. Savitri's Yoga is for the conquest of death. Ashwapati's Yoga is to bring down the divine power upon the earth so that it is through her the divine manifestation can take place. His main concern is to bring down the divine power upon the earth. And whatever is required for that, he is going to do it. Whatever hardships are involved, howsoever painful and severe may be the path, Ashwapati is going to face all those difficulties. He is going to meet all the challenges of the antagonist powers which would come in the way of the descent of Divine Shakti upon the earth. Severe and painful that is how Shabindu describes his yoga. 
severe and painful. Mother also speaks about Shrivendra. He who has suffered, struggled for us, achieved for all us, who has struggled for us, who has suffered for us. That is the divine avatars work in order to bring down the supreme power upon the earth. He has to suffer for that he suffered. Savitri's yoga is for a different purpose. And it is in relationship with that that the divine power is descending straight away into the center of will and noise. So last time we had just started the second canto of the Yuka Yuga, the parable of the search for the soul. We had read a few lines also, but let us look into the title of the canto itself, the parable, the search for the soul. It looks rather strange why the yogi poet is calling this canto a parable. And what is a parable? In what context it is going to convey the sense which is not really so common with the word used in most of the places parable as a fiction, as a story, as a narrative, as a fable. Is it in this context that he is using the word parable? Certainly, it cannot be so. It could be, if at all we have to say something connected with it, in a literary sense, it could be an analogy, it could be a discourse, it could be an epilogue. Epilogue. Even these words do not really convey the sense of the word parable which is present here in the title. So let us first see what exactly we could understand from the word parable. Parable is something which is having Greek Latin origin. Parable, para, beside, beyond. And bowl to throw, to cause. So if you go by the etymological sense of the word parable, beside or beyond, and to throw, it means that it is having a connotation of indicating something which is not directly conveyed by the story, but which is incorporated in a certain sense in the story itself. That is what it would mean basically here. So parable is a placing beside something. It is a search for the soul and it is indicative of that particular search which is being conveyed here. Listen. It is an earthly story with heavenly meaning celestial sense with something supernatural which is going to happen here. It is a common mundane narrative but indicating something which is going to be supernatural in its contents. Now the word parable occurs at a couple of places in Shrivendu's writings 
elsewhere also. For instance, we have the description of the ten avatars of Vishnu, which he calls as the parable of evolution, a sort of a narrative, figuratively presented in the parable, in the story, in the narrative of evolution. The ten avatars of Vishnu, Matsya, starting from the fish. We got the ten avatars here. Let me just go to them. Matsya, fish, then Kurma, tortoise, Varaha, goat, Nrasimha, half man, half lion, Vamana, the dwarf, Parshurama, Rama of the axe, then Rama, that is Ramachandra, I would call him. Following him is Krishna, and then Buddha is also included in the series of these ten avatars as the ninth avatar, Buddha, Krishna, Buddha, and then of course the last avatar is Kalki avatar. So we have got Matsya, Kurma, Varaha, Narasimha, Vamana, Parshuram, Rama, Krishna, Buddha, and Kalki, the last avatar, tenth avatar, the appearance of the eternal in this creation, that is what Kalki avatar means. Now each avatar has a specific function in the evolution of consciousness on earth. And the way in which this is described here, fish, tortoise, boar, man, lion, the dwarf, Rama, the mental way, Krishna, the over mind avatar, the avatar the supreme, presenting himself as the over mind Vishnu here, and then Buddha. Now, in one place, Shabandu says that although historically Buddha follows Krishna, but in terms of the spiritual work, he precedes Krishna. He comes before Krishna in terms of spiritual work. Now it is in the context of nothing but in conscience coming in the way of the higher manifestation, that is what one could say that is represented by Buddha. Nirvana, remove everything, blow out all that belongs to the inconscience and go into the absolute so that you are absolutely clean of all these inconscient things. There is sin, there is desire, Krishna, or whatever you want to call it, they are no more present there at all. And what would remain will be the pure self, not even God, the pure self. It is in that foundation that the work of Krishna would proceed in establishing the over mind consciousness in the physical. Krishna comes for that. Rama came for the mental consciousness. Krishna comes for the over mind consciousness. Kalki will come or perhaps has come for establishing 
the higher, the transcendental consciousness, the eternal himself. And in that sense, it is the last avatar, in the series of these ten avatars. Now, this narration of the avatars in the Puranas is a clear indication of the progressive nature of the evolution in the earth consciousness. It is having a great similarity, so to say, with the biological evolution starting from fish to man and perhaps even beyond that. The similarity is very distinct, very prominent, very noticeable in this context. But basically, it is the establishment of the higher consciousness successively that is what is presented here. The progression is striking, starting from fish all the way to Kalki. The progression is striking and of course it is unmistakable what is going to happen in the course of evolution of consciousness which also prepares the necessary body for expression. So when the eternal comes here, the Kalki, automatically, so to say, or necessarily the physical body also will be prepared for that expression. It will not be a body born of the inconscient stuff. The body will awaken to its divine sense, to its divine reality and express the eternal in terms of manifestation or the possibility in the spirit in this creation. That is what is going to happen with the arrival of the Kalki Uttar and the process has already begun in the occult physical. The object of Uttar is to lead the evolution on this earth and the parable is in that sense very significant. That is the parable of the evolution in the Puranic tradition. Well, we could also say that this description of Parshura, Rama, Krishna, Buddha in the series of ten avatars is has to be post Buddhistic. The Purana which are expressing this thing must have been composed or written or given after the birth of Buddha. Buddha is therefore recognized by the Puranas as an avatar, which is very great, very significant. It is not as the founder of the religion we call Buddhism, that we recognize him, but as one who sees the necessity of Nirvana to purify oneself fully from the stigma of inconscience is what Buddha is doing, is achieving. And the Puranas do recognize the contribution of Buddha of that avatar in the series of this avatar books. In fact, in the Sijam Gita, Sri Aurobindo speaks of Christ also as an avatar. Krishna, Christ, Buddha. He says that also. Now the avatar of Christ, or even perhaps for that matter, of the Buddha may not be exactly in the same line as the avatars of Vishnu in the nature of Matsya, Kurma, Varaha, Nasima, Vamana, Prasurama, Rama, Krishna. It could be another line of avatarhood. 
Still, the presence of Buddha in the main line is necessary, is significant, and has to be there. The avatarhood of Christ is important because it is the opening of the divine, the opening to the divine of the individual psychic being, the power of love, the expression of love. It is that which has been established by Christ of the So it is not in that sense something which is in the line of consciousness. It is more in the nature of the occult and inner contents of growth that is being conveyed by the avatarhood of Christ. And from that angle we can say that he belongs to a slightly different line. Yet that is also necessary for the collective manifestation of the divine in his creation, the avatarhood. Now, it is that parable what is being conveyed in the parable of evolution. We are talking here now the parable of the search for the soul. The word parable is very familiar to those who have read some of the stories narrated by Christ himself. He would express he would give his instructions in terms of explanations to people, simple people, by using parables as a sort of an illustrative story. That is how he would explain his doctrines, his ideas, his teachings to people in the course of time. <coughs> We have, therefore, the sense of parable as something which is designed use of language. Language has been designed for a specific purpose to convey some secret meaning, some esoteric sense, something which is not immediately grasped by the common man, but through the parable, he kind of gets a notion of what could be behind it. And it is that we call a parable. Design, use of language to convey some secret meaning. In fact, Christ is said to have told that he will open his mouth with parables. He will explain things in terms of parables. I will open my mouth in parables. This is what he will do. And some of the famous parables are, we are aware of them in several context. But maybe we can quickly revise those ideas which are conveyed by the term parable. We have got first, of course, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, it may look like a moral story, but it conveys something deep, something very spiritual also, something which has intimate psychological psychic relationship with things around and it is that which is now being conveyed here in terms of parable. When you have got the parable of the Good Samaritan, what happens there? A traveler is going from Jerusalem to Jericho and on the way he is caught by the robbers. All his belongings are taken away from him. He is beaten. He is almost half dead. And is abandoned 
and the robbers run away. This man remains there helpless, lying on the road. A priest comes, looks at him and walks away. He doesn't kind of care for him. He would not like to touch a traveler, a simple person. A Levitan comes. He also looks at him and walks away. The poor man does not get any help from the high members of the society. But then comes a Samaritan. He looks at his plight. He is touched. He does not see that this man who is lying here in a helpless state is a Jew. He does not see that. The Samaritan and the Jews, they are traditional enemies. But he keeps aside all those things and he goes and helps him. He lifts him up, gives him water drink, makes him walk and use whatever help is required for the person to go on. So this is the role of the good Samaritan. Obviously, it is a story which looks a story with a moral. But surely there are deeper meanings also. We could see them in different contexts, in a different manner. Then of course there is another parable, the parable of the prodigal son. We are all familiar with that. A rich man, an old man, he had two sons. And the younger son wanted to go away and live his own independent life. Therefore, he asked his father to give him the share of his property. The father gives him what is due to him. The son, young man, goes out of the world, into the world, falls into bad habits, squanders away all the money, he has left nothing, he has le he's left with nothing, and comes back to his father's place. The father receives him cordially. In fact, he arranges a feast for him in his honor, he arranges a feast. But his elder son refuses to attend the feast. The father tells him, look, he has repented. He is coming back for help. He has washed away his faults and it is appropriate now for us to give him the necessary help. So the prodigal son is received with full consideration by his father and whatever is due to him is going to him again and the elder son also recognizes the importance of what his father was telling. Now that is again a story which is perhaps in a social context but at the same time it has a deeper sense. There is another story, in fact there are a couple of parables like that, we may be quickly looking at them to get some idea. The parable of the lost coin, an old woman she had ten coins, ten drachmas. But in the night, one of the coins fell down on the road. She lit up a candy and started searching for the lost coin. She went around here and there, everywhere, and finally, she found the lost coin. 
it is not that the remaining nine coins would not have sufficed. Us. It is not that question. The question is the value of money, of drachma. It is that which should not get lost. The coin come back, coin may get lost also, but the value which is associated with it, that should not get lost. And it is that which is illustrated by a simple example of the old woman lighting a candle in the darkness looking for the lost coin. We have lost our soul in the night. We have to light a candle and look for it. The parable or the search for the soul is something of that kind. We have to look for the soul by lighting a candle. Then of course we have another parable, the parable of the lost sheep. A shepherd had hundred sheep. But one sheep in the evening got lost, got straight away and could not be easily found. There were only 99 sheep left. The shepherd had two options. One is not to risk the remaining 99 sheep, but take them back home and see about the lost sheep next day. The other option is have the conviction that nothing will happen to the 99 sheep and look for the lost sheep. Look for the sheep which is lost. It is the second option which he accepted, which he implemented. He went around and looked for the lost sheep. And after good search, he found the lost sheep. He picked it up, put it on his shoulder, and brought it back to the other 99 sheep which were there. And then throw all the other sheep to the place we were. Now that is the parable of the lost sheep. Well, let me narrate one more parable, the last parable in the present series here. The parable of what is called Ten Virgins. The bridegroom was to arrive in the evening for the celebration, for the festival for the occasion. Now all these ten maidens, they waited for him. They lighted a candle and waited and waited for the arrival of the bridegroom. But for some reason, he became late. The five maidens, they kept on waiting for him. And the other five maidens, they got impatient and they walked away. These five who remained there, they kept the lamp burning throughout the night and waited and waited for the bridegroom. And finally, he arrived and these five maidens were extremely happy. Those other five who had no patience to wait, they missed the occasion, they missed the feast, they missed the celebration, the patience, the devotion for the right room. It is that which gave these five minutes the beautiful reward. Now again, this is something very significant in its own sense. Now it is in this manner that Christ was educating the people in those days. 
they got the necessary sense, they got what is to be done in life, what is actually the meaning of all these things. Now, <clears throat> this conveying the deeper sense of life to the common man was important at that period of time. In that part of the world, he was dealing with a certain type of people and it is through them that things had to change. Now these parables, these kind of things which are there in the Bible in great number may not much appeal to the Indian mind. They may look very trivial sort of things. The way of teaching was different. In the days of Christ, in those tribes, there was no point in giving them the Upanishadic teaching, the Vedic teaching. It was absolutely out of the place to read to them the Life Divine, to read to them Savitri. It was a certain necessity for a certain period, for a certain kind of a psychic development that he had adopted this method of narrating the spiritual facts and truths and revelations in terms of parable. In that sense, they have a significance, they have a meaning, they have a content. But more than that, what we should recognize in these parables is establishing the psychic element in the common simple masses. It is a sort of an awakening of the psychic in people, in the collective life, that is the contribution of Christ of the Lord. Upanishads, they are very lofty, they are very great. They will talk of self, of Satyam, Rutam, Brat, all those great things, spiritual things. They are meant for a different type of an individual and a group of people. But when there has to be a collective awakening, if things had to happen here for a collective manifestation, it is not that only a certain sector of people is lifted up to high heavens or reach the transcendental worlds. If there has to be a manifestation of the Divine Presence upon earth, we have to take care of all these simple people also. And for that, the psychic opening is the best possible way of carrying out the mission for which Christ had come, for which he had suffered also, for which he had paid the price also. It is that avatar road which comes out in the story of the parable. Savitri's parable, search of the soul, is really the search. It is the value we that old woman is looking for in the lost coin. She is not craving for the coin. She is craving for the value of that coin. She is searching for that. She is lighting a candle in the night and looking around here and there everywhere that lost coin. The coin is already there in her soul, deep in her, but that has to be found. And that value has to be put into action. That is what the parable would really mean. Well, this is what the title would convey to us, the parable of the search for the soul. And it is here we see how rapidly Savitri's yoga begins and how rapidly it progresses with tremendous epic speed.
the poet has already launched on the pedal and she has to make rapid progress hardly a couple of days are at her disposal she must now enshrine in her soul the full divine power so that she can meet tomorrow the god of death and conquer him win victory over him last time we have seen some of the aspects of what the canto is calling the parable of the search for the soul the parable as a kind of a designed language describing something very specific in the context of what savitri is going to do that is the connotation or the phrase parable of the search for the soul in savitri it is not in the sense of the parable told by christ the stories he was narrating to people who had simple mind and simple understanding of things this is a deeper parable connected with the search of the soul of savitri savitri who herself is the divine incarnate the supreme mother incarnate and she is going to search the soul <coughs> which means that she has taken a human birth and in the human birth she has to first find the soul let us first read the relevant parts before we go into some of these details as in the vigilance of the sleepless night through the slow heavy footed silent hours repressing in her bosom is load of grief she is sat staring at the dumb trait of time and the approach of ever nearing fate a summons from her being summit came a sound a call that broke the seals of night above her brows where will the knowledge meet a mighty voice invaded mortal space it seemed to come from inaccessible heights and yet was intimate with all the world and knew the meaning of the steps of time and saw eternal destinies changeless scene filling the far prospect of the cosmic gaze as the voice touched her body became a star and rigid golden statue of motionless trance the stone of god lit by an amethyst soul around her body stillness all grew still her heart listened to slow measured beats her mind renouncing thought heard and was mute why chemist thou to this dumb that bound earth this ignorant life beneath in different skies tied to sacrifice on the altar of time o spirit o immortal energy if it was to nurse grief and helpless heart or with heart careless eyes awake thy doom arise o soul and vanquish time and death 
that is the command the voice is bringing arise o soul and vanquish time and death now we already have here something very deep something very significant something of a far reaching consequence in the yogic life of savitri which is about to begin her life begins with the samans coming from the summit of her being from the supreme self of hers the samans is coming to the human savitri who is the part of that supreme savitri herself so it is one savitri who is addressing to the other savitri she has taken a mortal birth and it is the voice of the immortal birth which is guiding her initiating her rather on this yogic journey which is about to begin now there are a couple of things which may be sort of pertinent if we are going to read in savitri the yogic life of the mother here in savitri savitri is receiving the samans from her beings summit did the mother receive any command like that any summons to begin her yogic life it may be sort of foolish on her part to ask that question but it has a certain pertinence also if we are going to link up savitri with the mother the mother never received any command any summons she was born already with that yogic consciousness it had only to flower out and grow and get into action there was no question of her receiving the command command to a certain extent in a certain context was received it was received by shivendu but not by the mother she was constantly in communion with her central being she had identified herself with the supreme lord right from the beginning and whatever had to happen in her life was only a question of unfolding of things in a yogic way but in savitri savitri receiving the samans is to be seen not in a temporal context it has to be seen in the ageless context in the context of the work savitri has been doing through the ages life after life since the beginning of the earth whenever and wherever there was a possibility of the manifestation of the supreme she was always present and it is in that context that this savitri 
is receiving the summons, the command, the imperative that she must set herself on the yogic path. Yogic path for what purpose? That is also defined uniquely, distinctly, to vanquish time and death. To vanquish time and death. So the entire context of Savitri's yoga is winning the victory over time and death, Kala and Yama. It is over them she has to win the victory. And to win this victory, therefore, the death of Satyavan becomes a yogic pretext, an occasion that she can confront, meet face to face, death and conquer him in the occult battle. That is the purpose of the initiation of Savitri on the yogic path. A summons from her being, summit came, a sound, a call that broke the seals of night, night and capital, under Tamasa, the darkness, the primordial darkness, and the seals of that primordial darkness, they had to be broken. So, Savitri's Yuga is founded in a very specific manner for breaking the seals of the night, for conquering time and death. And whatever she has to do, she will do in that context, in relationship with that. Above her brows, here, where will and knowledge meet, a mighty voice invaded mortal space. A mighty voice, the voice of the Supreme Savitri herself is coming and making an impact on her forehead where knowledge and will meet. The Ajna Chakra is the place where the impact is first made. Knowledge to know the steps of time, will to conquer time and death. So again, the functionality of the arrival of the voice on the forehead center, Ajna Chakra, where the command is received, where the command comes, becomes very pertinent. In fact, the poetry of Savitri is yogically very tight, very coherent, very functional also. Every word, every phrase has a kind of an interconnectedness with her yogic work. Above her brows, where will and knowledge meet, a mighty voice invaded mortal space. The immortal voice is invading the mortal space. Savitri's Ajna Chakra has got kindled, awoken. Now, <clears throat> We must also appreciate one very important thing in this context. The book seven is called the Book of Yoga. This is a book of yoga describing Savitri's yoga. It is not your yoga, my yoga, 
not even ashwapati's yoga not even shevendu's yoga it is specifically the yoga of the mother our yoga will be of a different type depending upon the preparation and the need of our soul so let us not be under the illusion that well let us follow the book of yoga no it is not meant for us it is for sakti alone because it is she who is going to conquer time and death we are not in a position to conquer time and death even if our soul becomes extremely powerful it is still too small to conquer time and death it is only the soul of savitri who after receiving the full power of supreme savitri who can conquer time and death so what we are going to see is how savitri is going to proceed on the yogic path of us and that is the only way of our trying to get to some extent into the spirit of savitri's yoga and in the process something might awaken in us and put us also on our own individual yogic path that distinction is important <clears throat> so when a mighty voice in which mortal space is again in the context of savitri it seemed to come from inaccessible heights the poet is saying it seems but actually it is coming for the mortal eye the place may be invisible and therefore he is telling it to us that it seems to come from some inaccessible heights and yet was intimate with all the world the purpose of that voice coming is again for the benefit of this world for the good of this world it has that want that intimacy with his creation something has to happen here the consciousness of time and death has to happen here for this creation not for savitri savitri is immortal already she doesn't need that petri for herself that petri is for this creation and therefore it is intimate with all the world and knew the meaning of the steps of time knew the meaning of the steps of time the three steps of time the past the present the future that voice knows what was there in the past what is going to happen today savitri's husband is going to die today it knows that what is going to happen tomorrow the new manifestation arising out of that death it knows all these things and therefore contextually the coming of the voice is to build up the entire temporal force to achieve that result and saw eternal destinies changeless scene filling the far prospect of the cosmic gaze that is what this voice sees the cosmic gaze is filled with its look in the steps of time it knows what is going to happen and the voice touched her body savitri's body savitri is an extremely good recipient 
of this tremendous force. She is not shaken. She is not shattered. Her adhara is powerful enough, stable enough to receive the full force of the invading voice. As the voice touched her body became a stark and rigid golden statue of motionless trance. A stone of God lit by an amethyst soul. Now again, this is very powerful mystic poetry with all the deep occult symbolism present everywhere. A stone of God, Savitri is still like a stone, marble, beautiful, bright, well-lit, stable. Stone of God, lit by an amethyst soul. Amethyst. <coughs> Why amethyst? Why not sapphire? Why not emerald? Why not diamond? Well, the poet is a yogi. The poet has of knowledge of things. The poet is also well learned in Greek mythology. He knows the connotations of these Greek mythological symbolisms. Amethyst, amethyst, a means not, taste, get drunk. One who does not get drunk, that is what the word amethyst means. Well, there is a story, but we can see that thing separately about amethyst. <coughs> amethyst is a stone of which the cups were made and the Greek gods and the Greek heroes drank wine from that cup made of amethyst. The belief being that whatever quantity of wine you drink, you would not get drunk with it. Now therefore, why is the poet here referring a stone of God lit by an amethyst soul, when the divine power is going to pour into the soul, when the divine energy, when the divine ananda, the divine ecstasy is going to pour into the soul, it is not going to get drunk with it. It can keep on receiving inexhaustibly, more and more continuously with that divine power. That is already the quality of Savitri's soul. Its receptivity that it keep on receiving the divine splendor which is pouring into her soul. That is the kind of a stone Savitri has already become amethyst soul, lit by the amethyst soul. A stone of God, which is a golden statue of motionless trance. It is under that conditions the yogic knowledge, yogic initiation is pouring into the soul of Savitri. Around her body stillness, all grew still. Around her body stillness, not only Savitri, but the entire place. The heart in which Savitri is dwelling, the rooms, the kitchen, the hermitage around, the ashramas of the rishis, the forest, the trees, the surroundings, 
everything is charged with the presence now. There is a sudden change in the atmosphere. The moment that voice comes and touches Savitri. Those who are perceptive, those who have a spiritual sense, they immediately feel the difference that something else has happened here. They receive the forest. They realize that some different power has come down here and is entering into the life. Around the body stillness, all grew still. Her heart listened with slow, measured beats. Her mind, renouncing thought, heard and was mute. It felt silent. She is in the state of silent mind. When nothing of her, who is going to disturb the invading voice, affect the invading power? And what does the voice say? Why camest thou to this dumb, death bound earth? Tell me, what is the purpose of your coming here? You are standing here helpless. You are driven with grief. The affliction is present in your soul. But is it for that purpose that you have come here? Yes, the griefs self has become calm. It can receive the command. But now it has prepared itself to get going on the yogic path. This ignorant life, many indifferent skies, tied like a sacrifice of the altar of time, are you a creature who is now tied to the stakes, ready to be sacrificed to the gods? You are not here for that purpose. You are here to conquer time and death. I take a sacrifice of the altar of time. O oh, spirit, O oh, immortal energy, if it was to nurse grief in a helpless heart or oh, with heart, tearless eyes, awake, thy doom. You have not come here for that purpose. It is a rhetorical question. Savitri, you have not come here to accept grief and sorrow and suffering. Get rid of it and awake and be prepared to vanquish time and death. That is the command which is coming from our summits. Sorry, summits being. Now, <coughs> this is also poetically put in a very powerful, in a very artistic manner. Let us read this command which Savit is singing. Why camest thou to this dumb, death-bound earth? This ignorant lie beneath indifferent skies I like a sacrifice at the altar of time. O oh, spirit, O oh, immortal energy, if it was a nurse, grief in a helpless heart, or with hard, careless eyes, awake thy doom. Arise, O oh, soul, and vanquish time and death. So this is the command in ten lines Savitri is receiving. She has the voice has touched the forehead, her will and power, knowledge, they got awakened and she has now to get ready. Now let us see the poetry of these few lines. Very interesting. Very powerful, the poet, 
the yogi as a poet as an artist has brought out several shades into the brief description why chemist dal to this dam death bound earth this line is heavy in syllables why chemist dal to this dam death bound earth you have in a simple line like this metrically and in a very unusual manner three spondies why comes thou to this down death bound up it comes with a kind of a trust with a force the voice is speaking straight away with a tremendous force with full impact the spondies coming in the line then this to some extent it is softened in the next line this ignorant life beneath and different skies the line is kind of expanding out slowly this ignorant life you have here an amp an anapest again and i am i am an anapest the line is moving forward climbing up this ignorant life beneath and different skies in contrast with why came us down to this dam death bound earth the meter the rhythm the bring the full force the voice tied like a sacrifice on the altar of time tied like it starts the heavy syllable tied like a trucky a sacrifice you are here and am sacrifice bring on the altar and a piece of time again and a piece see the variation of the meter brings a sort of a rhythmic force into the entire passage oh spirit oh immortal energy again i am peric i am i am peric if it was to nurse grief in a helpless heart basically again i am ambic line with the dip of a trocky in between or with hard tearless eyes away die do arise o soul and when with time and death this line is a perfect ambic line all the five beat as i am Arise, O soul, and bang with time and death. The rhythm is consistent. It is kind of beating. It must happen, must happen, must happen, must happen. Arise, O soul, and bang with time and death. So that is the assertive nature of the voice itself. Yes. Now <clears throat> there is one more point which may be. of some interest this line what we are here in the first edition of savitri is or with heart tearless eyes awake thy do tearless eyes awake thy do this is what we have here the latest edition of savitri makes this awake as a wait or with thy heart tearless eyes await thy doom so savitri received the command the summons from our beings summit it is a summons there is an imperative in the command it can not be disobeyed savitri must accept what she is being told to do there is a difference between the summons or command 
and Adesh. Savitri is not receiving an Adesh. She is receiving an order. But in the case of the Adesh, it is possible to ignore what is being told. In the case of a command, you cannot, you should not, you will not be able to ignore it. When Shrivendu received the Adesh, go to Chandranagar and later go to Pondicherry. It had a suggestive imperativeness in it. He could have ignored it. But by this time, he had developed a strong spiritual perception to go by the Adesh. On an earlier occasion, he had heard the voice, kind of an Adesh, which he ignored. And the result was, he landed in the jail as an under trial prisoner in Alipur from 5th May 1908 to 5th May 1909. Well, he had ignored the voice, the suggestion, but later on he was also told that I have brought you here for a purpose. And it is from this point onward his dynamic spiritual life begins. He had by now acquired his strength to go by what is being told to him in the form of an adesh. In the present case, as far as Savitri is concerned, there is no question of Adesh. It is simply a Saman, Shamar being, Samit came, a sound, a call, blow the seals of night. That is the power of the command, breaking the seals of night, the darkness of the ages the primordial night, where from the entire opposition to the divine manifestation springs up. Break the seals of night, that is the purpose of the command also. The voice makes its impact straight on the eyebrow center, Adnya Chakra. Suddenly, this lotus opens out and Savitri has to go by it, by what she has been told, the will and the knowledge, they will come into operation in the dynamics of her yoga. The voice touched the body and it became a stark and rigid golden statue of motionless trance. A stone of God lit by an amethyst soul. This is what the command has already done. She has become extremely calm, immobile, a golden statue lit 
by the amethyst soul. So whatever amount of divine power might pour into it, into her soul, it will not get intoxicated. It will not get drunk with it. Savitri can keep on absorbing whatever divine power will be rushing into her. That is the amethyst soul. Around her body stillness, all grew still. And then what does the voice say? What is the command she receives? It's very specific. It tells her directly, straight away, without means words, what she must do. It is an imperative, as I said. Why camest thou to this dumb, death bound earth? This ignorant lie beneath indifferent skies, tired like a sacrifice on the altar of time. O oh, spirit, O oh, immortal energy, if it was to nurse grief in a helpless heart, or with heart tearless eyes, awake thy doom. It is for that purpose that thou hast come here. No, surely it is not for that. Then Savitri must arise. Arise, O soul, and vanquish time and death. That is the command. She must get prepared to carry out this mission of her birth. There is no hesitation, no wavering in the voice. It's full throated, vibrant, powerful, making the full impact on the soul of Savitri. Yet, Savitri is not in a position to see the fullness of what the voice is trying to convey to her. She has hesitation. She has a reservation regarding what she is to do, why she should do anything at all, why she should even obey the command. But Savitri's heart replied in the dim night, all these things are happening in the night when Satyavan is asleep and Savitri is doing the yoga all the while. But Savitri's heart replied in the dim night, My strength is taken from me and given to death. Why should I lift my hands the shut heavens of struggle with mute, inevitable fate, or hope in vain to uplift an ignorant race who hugged the Lord and mocked the Savior light and see in mind wisdom's soul tabernacle and its harsh speak and his inconscient ways, a rock of safety and an anchor of sleep. Is there a God whom any cry can move? He sits in peace and leaves the mortal strength impotent against his calm, omnipotent law and in conscience at the almighty hands of death. What need have I? What need has Satyavan? 
to avoid the black mist net, the dismal door, or call a mightier light into life's closed room, a greater law into man's little world. Why should I strive with earth's unyielding laws or stave off death's inevitable hour? This surely is best to pactize with my fate and follow close behind my lover's steps and pass through night from twilight to the sun across the tenebrous river that divides the adjoining parishes of earth and heaven. Then could we lie in arm breast upon breast, untroubled by thought, untroubled by our hearts, forgetting man and life and time and its hours, forgetting eternity's call, forgetting God. To the command, Savitri receives, man which time and death. This is the answer she is making. Savitri is putting a counter. She is not yet ready to directly accept the command, although it comes with an imperative force. She has a few points which she makes explicit in an answer to the command. Savitri answers back. Her answer is somewhat snappy, somewhat brisk also, somewhat, one might even say, arrogant. She is not going to accept what the voice is telling. It is as if she has her own mind and unless it is convinced, she is not going to proceed further. What are the arguments she is making? First she says, my strength is given to death. I have come here with the imperial power. born in the majesty as a princess, grown up in the loveliness of the world, found my lover in this difficult world. But now I see that he doomed to die. All that I possess is simply snatched away from me. I don't have any more strength left with me. Death has taken away the strength of me. Her strength is given to death. This is what she says, my strength is given to death. And then she says, what is the use of making a prayer to heaven, to God's they don't respond to our prayers. We weep and cry and then fall silent and no answer comes 
from the high gods. My prayer to shut heavens, that is the argument she is making, which is true in the human sense. We become helpless, we ask for certain things, but the gods there, their own reasons not to grant them, which we don't understand. Then finally she says, sorry, then again she says, why struggle with what is decreed, what is inevitable, what is bound to happen? It is fated that Satyavan must die. Accept it simply. Why struggle then against that fate? If fate is all that powerful, then no amount of my struggle against that fate is going to help me. That is the argument. So why bother about all those things? Just accept fate and live the life as it has come. Why struggle with the inevitable fate? And suppose, if at all I do struggle against fate, if at all I claim back my strength from death, if at all my prayer gets answered by heaven, what is it all for? For man? who is such an insufferable being, who does not understand anything, who has no opening, who has no aspiration. What for? For these creatures? Why hope to lift an ignorant race? They are happy with their lot. They will continue the life as it is going on. And my answers, the answers from my, my prayers, from heaven, getting back strength from death, in what way is it going to help mankind, the race, which is happy with its own misery, its own in pain, anguish, suffering. Man is not yet ready for receiving the higher rules, and therefore I don't see any point in making him struggle at all for him. Then of course she says also, look, I cry, I have shed tears and the God of pain has remained unappeased, dissatisfied, he is not responding at all. Does my cry reach God. That is a query. She is demanding an answer to the from the voice. The command is coming, but the command must also answer some of these questions before she can accept it. Is there a God whom a cry can move? And then of course she says, what need have I? What need has Satyavan to avoid black meshed net, the dismal door, or call a mightier light into life's flow room, a greater law into man's little world? What need have I? What need Satyavan has for the greater light? for the greater law which will change it. I don't need no sins at all, nor does Satyavan need them. Therefore, why should I struggle? Why should I go by what you are telling me? Arise, O soul, and vanquish time and death. Vanquish time and death for whom? For this man. It's not going to help him at all. That is an argument, very powerful argument. Now, it is not only the question of for this man, it is also a statement of fact. 
if it is not for man, is it going to be for me, for my husband, Satyavan? I would not need that. We have that light, that law, as our native character. We are born in that. We are not eliminated from light and for law. The Divine Incarnate is always in possession of that law and that light. So we don't need that law, not at all for myself. Of course, it's very true. Shemindu himself has said, neither me nor the mother want supplementary for ourselves. It is not for me that we need this permit. Because it is already there with us. Whatever we are going to do, it is for this creation. To execute the will of the Divine, of the Supreme in this creation, towards the manifestation of the Divine possibilities in this creation. It is for that purpose that we need Supermind, not for ourselves. We don't need deathlessness, we don't need this, that, nothing. It is for the Divine purpose that we need. So Savitri's answer here is very much related with that. What need have I? What need has Satyavan? When she is saying that she is in fact asserting the incarnate character of both of them, Satyavan and Savitri, to avoid the black nest, black, black mesh net, the dismal door of call a mighty light into life's closed room, a greater law into man's little world. Why should I strive with us unyielding laws or stay off death's inevitable hour? I can smash what has been already distinct. Death is bound to come. That hour is fixed. It is inevitable. It is decreed. Why should I stay it off? For what purpose? That is her query. For me, perhaps, the better thing is to follow in the steps of Satyavan when he is no more there. Go along with him. She is again suggesting in another manner of accompanying Satyavan as Sati. She is willing to go along with him. Plant herself into the burning fire of Satyavan and join him forever and be together in the other worlds. This surely is best to pactize with my fate. Let me make a pact with my fate. And let me accompany Satyavan. Yes, fate has decreed Satyavan death. Let me also make a pact with fate. Let me also join Satyavan. That is the pact Savitri is proposing. This surely is best to pactize with my fate and follow close behind my lover's steps and pass through night from twilight to the sun. It is there we can go and live together always. Across the tenebrous river that divides the adjoining parishes of earth and heaven. After crossing the tenebrous river, we could lie in armed, breast upon breast, untroubled by thought, untroubled by heart, forgetting man and life and time and this hour, forgetting eternity's call, forgetting God. We don't need anything. We can be always together. This is the proposal. Savitri is making. She 
he can withdraw from his creation along with the Dr. Satyavan and join him permanently in some other country of God. As far as she is concerned, she does not need light, the divine light, because it is always there with her. She has taken a human birth, Satyavan has taken a human birth. Well, we can build up this human birth and be together forever in the other world, in that light, in that law. Well, that is the general import of Savitri's counter to the command coming from her being's summit. She makes here a very distinct remark across the tenebrous river that divides the adjoining parishes of earth and heaven. Between this mortal world and the world after death, there is the dark tenebrous river which divides these two lands, these two countries, these two parishes. It is Vaitarani as presented to us by the Puranas, particularly Guru Da Purana. The soul after its departure has to cross this river Vaitarani and then go to its peaceful abode. That is what happens normally in the case of a good soul. In the case of a sinful soul, according to the Puranas, the soul has to pass through the southern walls and cross the southern gate and reach the land Yama where it lies until all its past karmas are burnt away, are exhausted, when it is ready to take the next birth. Vaitarani, the name itself is very beautiful, very lucid, and the waters are also clean and crystal, moving, with the liberty of life. Why? Yes, truly, the word why means truly, tarini, tarini, that is the actual form. One who saves, one who protects you beyond this life. Vaitarini, that is what Vaitarini is. It is that river which the soul crosses and reaches its abode of peace after death. Across the tenebrous river that divides the adjoining parishes of earth and heaven. In the Greek mythology also, we have the river Styx. It is after crossing the river that the departed goes to the underworld. Now this river Styx is a difficult river to cross. And there is a ferryman who helps you to take you across the river, Sharon. He is the one who takes the soul from one land to the other land. The Greek tradition is that 
the experiment demands is fair to take you from this land to the other land. So the custom is when a person dies, the relatives put a small coin in the mouth of the departed. The coin called obol. It is one obol which is put in the mouth of the departed. And it is that which is taken very happily, quickly, swiftly by the ferryman when he is taking the soul from this land to the other land. Obol is a coin of the smallest denomination. Actually, its value is zero. A whole in Greek also means zero. So it is that zero coin of value which itself is extremely valuable to the ferryman. He takes it as a spare and helps you to cross from this land to the other land. So Savitri is talking of the Tenebrous River by which she would like to go after the death of Satyavan by accompanying him also. Forgetting man and life and time and his hours, forgetting eternity's call, forgetting God. This is the kind of Vishala Yoga Savitri is practicing at this moment. Now, <coughs> incidentally, here Savitri is telling the voice personified Supreme Self or Savitri herself that she is prepared to go along with Satyavan by making a pact with fate. And she will cross this river, sticks or white running or whatever you want to call it, and join him forever permanently. Now, in the poem, Later, as Savitri is accompanying Satyavan spirit, you have got Satyavan spirit, behind him is death, behind them is Savitri following in his footsteps. And they are going to the abode of Yama. We do not have any description of any river they crossing it. There is no river which they are crossing as we shall see later on in those respective cantos. But Savitri is telling here that she is prepared to go with Satyavan by crossing this river. How is it that there is no mention of rebirth later on when the actual spirit, the dead spirit of Satyavan is being carried by Yama? Well, one crosses these rivers, those who are sinful, have blemished life and not really risen to the greatness of the spirit. It is they who cross this river. In the case of Savitri, here Savitri is in a human state and therefore she is expressing human anguish, human notion of things which happen after death. But actually the soul of Savitri is blameless, 
without any flaw, absolutely no sin. It is a radiant purity, untouched by any gloom, any fault. And therefore, there is no question of she crossing any river, a tenebrous river. In the case of the death of Satyavan, it is Yama himself who has come to pick up his soul. Yama doesn't have to cross that river. He is simply going back to his abode. So why Savitri is mentioning the possibility of going the Sati and crossing this river? In actuality, when the death occurs, there is no question of they crossing any river. You have got a detailed description of the landscape of the countries through which death is passing, but no Vaitarani is there, no sticks is there. So Savitri says, why should I bother about all these things, these creatures? Let me just accompany my husband and be with him forever. Obviously, the voice is not going to accept her argument. It has come with a certain degree of insistence and it is going to impose its will on human Savitri. Human Savitri will have to accept it. We have seen last time Savitri was counter arguing against the commands she had received from her summit's being. She wanted to forget man and life and time and its hours, forget the call of eternity, forget God himself. She wanted to walk away along with Satyavan to the other world get everything on the mission. She had taken an extreme viewpoint of abandoning all that is here. For her, the main concern, the chief concern, the chief love was Satyavan alone and she would sacrifice her life fully for his sake always with him. Forget man and life and time and his hours. Forget eternity's call. Forget God. She has at the moment no complete idea about the call of eternity about God himself, what intention he has for her. As human Savitri, she is taking an extreme viewpoint, a kind of vishad, regret, sorrow, lack of total interest in this creation. But that is of course not acceptable to the voice, which was coming from her own savage height being. It was not, it cannot be acceptable to the voice, the supreme voice, through the divine power governing the spirit of Savitri. So the voice replies, the voice replied, is this enough? O oh, Spirit, that she wanted to give up everything and walk away along with Satyavan, forgetting all the things. What for I should try? Why should I stop suffering in time and all that? 
Why should I bother? this human race, she was arguing with that, but the voice is stern and almost in a spirit of reprimand, tells Savitri, asks Savitri, demands Savitri an answer, is this enough, O oh Spirit? Even Savitri is not in a position to understand that, but her spirit should be able to tell directly what is in it. The voice replied, Is this enough, O Spirit? And what shall thy soul say when it wakes and knows the work was left undone for which it came? Or it is all for thy being born on earth, charged with a mandate from eternity, a listener the voices of the ears, a follower of the footprints of the gods, to pass and live unchanged the old dusty laws. Shall there be no new tables, no new world, no greater light come down upon the earth, delivering her from her unconsciousness? Man's spirit from an unutterable fate. Cast thou not down to open the doors of fate, the iron doors that sin forever closed, and lead man to trust wide and golden road that runs through finite things to eternity. Is this then the report that I must make? My head bowed to shame before the eternal succeed. His power he killed in the body has failed. His labor returns, her task undone. Then Savitri's heart fell mute. He spoke no word. But holding back her troubled rebel heart, abrupt, erect and strong, calm like a hill, surmounting the seas of mortal ignorance, he speak immutable above mind's air. The power within her answered, the still voice. I am thy portion here, charged with thy work. As thou myself seated forever above, speak to my depths, O great and deathless voice, command, for I am here to do thy will. The voice replied, Remember why thou camest, find out thy soul, recover thy hid self. In silence is God's meaning in thy depths, then mortal nature change to the divine. Open God's door, enter into his trance. Cast thought from thee, that nimble ape of light. In his tremendous hush, standing by brain, is vast and know and see. Cast from thee, sense that veil the spirit's sight, in the enormous emptiness of thy mind. Thou shalt see the eternal's body in the world. Know him in every voice, heard by thy soul. In the world's contacts, meet a single touch. All things shall fold thee into his embers. Conquer thy heart's throbs. Let thy heart Beat in God, thy nature shall be 
the agent of his works. The voice shall house the mightiness of his word. Then shall thou harbor my foes and conquer death. Then Savitri, by her doomed husband, sat, still digit in her golden, motionless poise, a statue of the fire of the inner sun. In the black night, the wrath of storm set by, the thunder crashed above her, the rain hissed, its million footsteps pattered on the roof, impassive with the movement and the cry, witness of the thoughts of mind, the moods of life, she looked into herself and sought for her soul. With the command, Savitri is now poised to seek her soul. She had been told very firmly that she cannot afford to argue, the, to take the stand she had proposed to do. It is impossible for her to do that. And the voice was firm. And the voice came from the highest soul of Savitri. The voice is making specific points. Firstly, in answer to the arguments Savitri herself had put, why struggle with this ignorant world? Why for this man anything be done when he is stupid, foolish, mute, dumb? What for? Let me go back and live in my heaven with my lover and husband. That is how she was arguing. But the voice says, Is this enough? How can you say like that? In fact, it is about to say that you had no business to talk, talk that way. You cannot talk like that at all. You have come here with a certain purpose, with a mission which you had to fulfill. And you can't say things like that, what for? The voice replied, is this enough, O oh, Spirit? It also tells Samitri that her soul has come here to do some divine work. It has not come here for nothing. There is a mission in her taking the birth in the human form. And she has to accomplish that. She has to complete that mission. What shall thy soul say when it wakes and knows the work was left undone? You want to go away like this, leaving the work unfinished, unattempted. How can you? For which it came. The soul had come here to do some work. And you want to leave all the thing and go away. This is something stupid of you. It's almost saying like that, you see. You can't afford to that. The work was left undone for which it came. What is the work? That, of course, you could tell very briefly also. He has come here with a mandate, and Savitri's soul knows the work she has to do here. But now the voice is going to make it explicit clear, distinct. Look, Savitri, this is what you had to do. This, 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 this. The work was left undone for which it came. Is this what you propose to do? To go away, leaving the work half done, undone? Or is this all for thy being born on earth, charged with a mandate from eternity? You have come here with a mandate mandate coming from the Supreme Himself. You have been charged with the mandate and you have 
have to accept that command of the Supreme. Chant the mandate from eternity. What is voice? A listener to the voices of ears. Savitri has been listening to the voices through ages and ages and ages, crying for her help. The sorrow, the suffering, the misery of this world, supplicating Savitri, Savitri, please do something for us. You have been hearing these voices and now you want to shut yourself off from those. A listener to the voices of the ears, a follower of the footprints of the gods, you have been moving in the steps of the gods and now you want to walk away from me like a common out of a human being. How can it be? A follower of the footsteps of the gods to pass and live unchanged the old dusty laws. In other words, the voice is telling Savitri, look Savitri, you have come here to change this dusty laws, the laws of nature, the laws of ignorance, of fate, death. These laws have now become dusty and you have to throw them away and bring new laws of truth, of dynamism, of light, of beauty, joy, happiness. That is what you have to do here. And how can you say that you go away from here? To pass and live unchanged the old dusty laws. Shall there be no new tables? Yes, we have been living here in the world of ignorance. We have made our own entries based upon our half knowledge, half ignorance. And we are stuck with that. But is that going to be the permanent feature of this creation? Shall there be no new tables, no new world, the supreme world coming here and speaking, the old world has created something for a certain purpose in a certain situation. It has created certain laws. But now those laws have become dusty. They have become old. The law of fate, the law of death, the law of ignorance, they cannot remain permanently in that form forever. And you have to change those things. The follower, the footprints of the gods, and pass to pass and live and change the old dusty laws. Shall there be no new tables, no new world, no greater light come down upon the earth? That is the mission of your life to bring down the new light upon the earth. You have to bring new light. The old light has become dim, dark, dull, outdated. It cannot serve the purpose of this creation. It had a meaning up to a certain point, in a certain manner, in a certain situation. But that cannot be the permanent feature of this creation. Shall there be no new tables, no new world, no greater light come down upon the earth delivering her? from her unconsciousness, earth, Prithvi, Bhumi has been lying here through the ages under the sway of ignorance and fate and death in the condition, in the state of tamasa, of inertia, of mrityu, new possibilities for her from asat to sat, from darkness to light, from Rityu to Amruta, immortality, these things had to open out Asato Ma Sat Gamaya, Tamaso Ma Jyoti Gamaya, Mrityor Ma Amrutam Gamaya, that is what the earth is expecting, is praying for and you have a mission to listen to that voice, that call, that invocation of the earth and do your work. Man's spirit from unutterable faith comes down not down to open the doors of fate, they have been locked. So we cannot make any further progress at all. 
because fate is blocking that. The iron doors that sail forever closed and lead man to touch wide and golden road that run to finite things to eternity. The road is running from the finite to the infinite, from time into eternity. It is that road which has to be opened out for man, but the door is blocking, the door of fate is blocking that passage. You have to open out the door and let the passage be cleared for this progress and lead man to this wide and golden road that runs through finite things to eternity. Is this then the report I must make? If you are not going to do these things, what do I go and report to my boss who has told me go and ask Savitri to be ready for your work. But if I go to refuse it, what do I go and report? I will put my head down in shame. I will not be able to stand and face him and look into his eyes. Is this then the report that I must make? My head bow down with shame before the eternal succeed. His power he kindled in thy body's face. His power he kindled in thy body. This is what Savitri's birth means. Her physical body is also charged with the power of the Supreme. It has only in its possession that power of the Supreme, even in the physical. And you are saying that you will not do this thing. Has that power is sitting now in your body? Faith is this the report I am going to make to the Supreme. His power kindled in thy body has failed. His laborer returns her task undone. Savitri wanted to go away. Mr. Tavan walk away from this world, cross the tenebrous river and be with him in the other world. She wanted to go essentially as Sati, accompanying him as Sati. The voice says, sorry, Savitri, it is not for you. You cannot do that. You are here with a mission, with a different work to do and you have to do that kind of a thing here. So the voice is very firm, very insistent, very demanding also and practically Savitri has no option but to accept what she is being told to do. In fact, there is something very deep in her I'm here just for nothing. I have work to do. Through the ages, through years and years and years, I've been coming here for work, for some work to do. How can I go away? Savitri at once realizing that. The human part of Savitri, which was not opening to the divine power, has now realized that no, it cannot be so. It must get ready to do the assigned task. Is this then the report that I must make? My head bowed with shame before the eternal seed. His power, he kindled in thy body has failed. Now this is the greatest of Savitri. That is the incarnation. It is he himself in the form of Shakti, power, who has established in her physical body here. So Savitri is not an ordinary human being. Only in her physical body is the presence of that presence. <coughs> His laborer returns. She has to do hard work. She is a toiler. She cannot escape the work which is associated with the mission she has to do here. His laborer returns her task undone. Then Savitri's heart 
fell mute. He spoke no word. Suddenly Savitri has fallen silent. The voice has such effect on her entire being that it became absolutely calm, still, and what was present was only the force of that voice working in her. Then Savitri's heart fell mute, he spoke no word. But holding back her troubled, rebel heart, abrupt, erect and strong, calm with the hill, surmounting the seas of mortal ignorance. The whole sea of ignorance is there. The mortal ignorance is there. Savitri has taken a mortal birth, but now her soul realizes that it has to climb above the sea of ignorance like a mountain, like a hill, stand above all that is there around her. Abrupt, erect and strong, calm like a hill, surmounting the seas of mortal ignorance, he speak immutable above mind's air. A power within her answered the still voice of Savitri's inner being. The power which is poverty seated deep within her. The human portion of the divine which is present deep in her soul. It is that power now which is answering to the voice. A power within her answered the still voice, the voice which is coming down from above, the voice of the power which is above, the supramental, the transcendental Savitri, who is speaking to the human Savitri here. It is in that human Savitri that her power has awakened. A power within her answered the still voice, I am thy portion. Yes, I am your Ausha. Part of what you are, I am you. I am thy portion here, charged with thy work. Yes, I must do the work which you have proposed for me to do. I can't ignore it. I can't keep it aside. I can't dismiss it. I am the portion here charged with thy work. As thou myself seated forever above, you are seated above, always above me. And thou myself, I am myself seated above here. And this is what you are. As thou myself seated forever above, speak to my depths. Oh great and deathless voice, command, for I am here to do thy will. That is the purpose of my birth. Thy will, come on, please, please, please speak what I should do here. Forgive me, ignore what I was saying until now of walking away from this creation. I had now realized that there is some work to be done here and I must attend to that. <coughs> Command for I am here to do thy will. The voice replied, the voice finds Savitri now ready to receive the initiation. <coughs> Savitri is receiving Diksha to start yoga. How the yoga has to begin, that is now being told to Savitri. Diksha, initiation. <coughs> the voice replied, Remember why thou camest. Don't forget the purpose of your birth. Remember why thou camest. Find out thy soul. That is the first task which you have to do. Remember the purpose of your birth. Remember 
why we are here all in the ashram, <laughs> which we often forget and do all kinds of silly things, thousand silly things since we, are, we don't remember the purpose of our coming here. But here the problem is more serious. It is a fundamental problem, <coughs> the cosmic problem, the problem of creation itself. And it is in that context Savitri is being told that she must remember the purpose of her birth. Find out that soul. All right, the remember is okay, but it's not enough. In order to do what you are supposed to do, that you of course remember now. But in order to do that, you must first discover your soul and go by what your soul is going to tell you, not your outer human nature, not your surface being, but the deep soul within, it is that which will tell you what to do. In other words, the human portion of the divine Shakti seated in the soul of Savitri has to get into operation and carry out the mission task. Find out thy soul, recover thy herself in silence. Seek God's meaning in thy depths. Don't argue. Don't get put out. Don't be passionate. Don't be emotional. Don't be tamasic. In full luminous voice of peace and calm. Understand the purpose of your birth and do what you are supposed to do. The first thing which you have to do is find out the meaning of your birth in thy soul, in thy depths. Find out that first. Remember, then seek your soul. Find out the purpose of that soul, what it is supposed to do. So, the voice has already described the three steps by which Savitri's yoga has to begin. Then, when that is done, when then mortal nature change to the divine, when you go by the promptings of your soul, then what you are standing here as a mortal, it will be no more mortal. It will change into the divine your nature, your physical presence, everything will be charged with divine presence and power. So that is the Siddhi, that is the Parashruti of your yogic sadhana. First you remember the purpose of your birth, find out your soul, find out the purpose of the presence of the existence of your soul, what it is supposed to be here. That it is this creation which has to go from the mortal state to the state of immortality. That is the task which you are supposed to do. Then mortal nature changes to the divine. Open God's door, enter into his trance. So step by step the entire recipe is being given to Savitri. Do this, do this, do this, do this. All the points are being listed one after the other. And it is in that sequence that Savitri must begin the yoga and walk on the yogic path. Open God's door, enter into his trance, and then cast thought from the after all, what is thought, it is a creation of mind. It has no real truth in it. It is alright, but the real truth is something else. So it is not by thought that it should be led. It is not by emotion, by passion, by the body's desires that it should proceed. You have to find out something which is really deeper, something which is in line with the mission of your soul. Cast thought from the that nimble ape of light in his tremendous hush, stilling thy brain when you have the Siddhi or the silent mind, passive Brahman, then you see what? You see his vast truth awaking 
within you there is no thought there is no feeling there is no emotion there is no body's resistance to things under that condition what you see you see he is vast truth within you and it is with that truth that you will know things you will see things you will do things tas from the sense all our perceptions of knowledge cognition all the five senses behind the five senses the sense of mind mind manas that is the primary sense and then we have got the other five senses behind these beyond these is the true sense satyana when you have acquired that sense then you see the real things of this creation cast from the sense that weighs thy spirit aside satyana will not weigh the sight of the spirit from you it will tell you what the spirit is what the spirit sight is in the namas emptiness of thy mind thou shall see the eternal body in the world this is not the jadatva of indra's kind that god had intended it to be behind this world behind the jadatva this inertia brook matter is the presence of the divine himself therefore the voice says avitri thou shall see the eternal body physically present here in this world in this creation eternal body in the world no him in every voice Single touch, all things shall fall thee into his embers. So we'll have the universality of realization. It is not for you, for such a man, or for some specific purpose that you were born here. It is for this world, for this creation. And what do you see here? Yes, this whole world is the body of the eternal soul of Brahma himself. It is Brahma who is residing here physically, and that is what you realize and you see. All things shall fall thee into his embrace. Kanga the heart's throbs, the physical throbs which are there, you have to mass over them. In other words, even if your heart fails, you shall not die. You will not die. Power of conquering the heart beats would mean your conquest of death. You would be master of your life. Conquer the heart beat. Let thy heart beat in God. That is the immortality you will get. That is what shall be the end of these worlds. The voice shall house the. Sorry, the voice shall house the mightiness. of his word what you will be seeing walk vacha it is the divine vakya which will be spoken to you then shall thou harbor when this is done all these steps when you have accomplished when this is done thou shall harbor my force and conquer death so that is the condition if you want to conquer death This is the recipe for that. Follow it, and you will be victorious. Then, Savitri, by her doomed husband, sat, still rigid, in a golden, motionless pose, a statue of the fire of the inner sun. Savitri has become now the fire of the inner sun. Like a golden statue, unperturbed, ready now to follow the instructions given to her by the mighty voice. In the black night, the rough the storm swept by. The thunder crashed above her. She is sitting in the hermitage by the side of her husband, and outside 
the thunder crash above her, the rain hissed, its million footsteps pattered on the roof. It passed you mid movement and the cry, witnessed the thoughts of mind, the moods of life, witnessed the thoughts of mind, witnessed the moods of life. She looked into herself and sought her soul. She was asked to find out her soul. She has become a golden statue of peace, like a burning fire of the sun in her soul. And with that now she is ready on the yogic path. The first task in front of her is to find her soul. And then what has to be done, that she will be told as she progresses on the yogic journey.